Day 86, our hearts are broken this morning. Our spirits groan, our minds numb. As we're overwhelmed by the enormity of it all, we cry out to you. We plead for your mercy. By your spirit, lift those who have fallen. Sustain those who work to rebuild and fill us with the hope of your new creation. We know too well how small we truly are in this fragile yet temporary place we call home. Yet you've promised to never forget us. Console the hearts of those who mourn. Comfort them. Be their rock. Hide them in the shelter of your wings, especially where homes no longer exist. Surround them with our prayer for strength and bless those who have survived. Heal their memories of trauma and devastation. And may they have the courage to face the road of rebuilding ahead. It's a heavy day. I know that these things occurred over the last couple of days, so this isn't new to anyone. Um, for me, you know, I was traveling and I didn't even know that some of these things were happening, quite honestly, until I saw in the Facebook group people posting about it. And I thank God that they did so that I could then be in prayer for those who are hurting today, for those who have lost family members and loved ones. And of course, this isn't an isolated incident. You know, people lose family members every day. People hurt and go through devastation every single day. And for a lot of us, we don't ever get to hear about it, you know, and it doesn't hit home until it makes the news or until it's catastrophic or until children are involved. And this just brought me to a place of compassion and reminded me of the need for prayer daily for people all across the world, for the widows, the helpless, the, the poor, the fatherless, the abused, the helpless. I mean, there's so many people who have such specific need. And I know that we can't change the world, but one prayer at a time, us coming together corporately and praying for those in need, I believe God hears that. The Bible says that the prayers of the righteous man avails much. And I believe that if we continue to be in prayer, uh, and asking and pleading for mercy to be upon people every single day that God will hear that and even though we can't understand the things that happen uh, we can trust that he knows and that he knew and that he will turn it for good so not not an easy thing to face head-on but that's what we have to do we're called to do that as believers as children of God to push ahead, to move forward. And that's what we'll do from here. Um, just trusting the Lord that he, he's in control. So today is day 86, technically day 87, but we are doing lesson 86. We are reading through Joshua 15 through 18, where we are seeing more allotments of the land being given of the promised land. So Lord, you have heard the cries, the pleas, the prayers of your people this morning. And from the days past in the devastating news in the wake of it, Lord, we cry out to you desperately that you will be in the midst of those communities and that your arms will surround them with your comfort, your love, your strength, your compassion. I pray that you will be found in the midst of this, that your presence will be felt in such a way that it moves people into a different space in this life on this earth that they will come to know you as Lord and Savior so that they can rest in that peace and that love that only you can give. I pray for your children today who are coming together to draw near to you, to find that comfort in you, to hear from you. Lord, will you please speak today? We are your servants and we are listening. Open up our eyes, our ears, our hearts. If anything is standing in the way, Lord, I pray that you'll remove it. We give you full permission to have your way in our hearts today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, if you are new here, welcome to the Bible study. Everything you need is in the description box below, including what Bible I'm using, our reading plan, our Facebook group that you can join us. And then if everyone could help us out by giving this video a thumbs up, and that will help to continue to spread the word of God as well as getting people passionate for the word. And I said we were in chapter 15, but we're actually in chapter 16 today. So we're seeing the allotment for Ephraim and Manasseh, which are the two sons of Joseph. So this was two tribes in one, in a sense. 
And the allotment of the people of Joseph went from the Jordan by Jericho, east of the waters of Jericho, into the wilderness, going up from Jericho into the hill country to Bethel. Then going from Bethel to Luz, it passes along to Adaroth, the territory of the Archites. Then it goes down westward to the territory of the Japh. Latites, as far as the territory of the lower Beth Horon, then to Gezer, and it ends at the sea. So when we take a look at where they are on the map, and I will try to uh, make sure these are in the notes again today, we have Ephraim, which is right here in this green area, and then the other half tribe of Manasseh, which will be in this kind of peachy area. area. And of course, the other half tribe is on the east side of the Jordan, which they've already received their allotment. So the people of Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim received their inheritance. The territory of the people of Ephraim by their clans was as follows. The boundary of their inheritance on the east was Adaroth Adar, as far as Upper Beth Horon, and the boundary goes from there to the sea. On the north is Michmithath. Then on the east of the boundary turns around toward Teanath Shiloh and passes along beyond it on the east of uh, on the east to Genoa, then it goes down from Genoa to Adaroth and to Neira and touches Jericho, ending at the Jordan. From Tapua, the boundary goes westward to the brook Cana and ends at the sea. Such is the inheritance of the tribe of the people of Ephraim by their clans, together with the towns that were set apart for the people of Ephraim, within the inheritance of the Manassites, all those towns with their villages. However, dun, 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 they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites have lived in the midst of Ephraim to this day, but have been made to do forced labor. Now we know that God has specifically commanded the people to drive out the inhabitants of the land. So here we're seeing that that is not happening. So I raised the question, okay, did they actually want the forced labor? Did they want the slaves to help them out? And that's why they didn't drive them out. Because if you think about it, if they have the power to get these people to obey them into slavery, then you would think that they had the power to actually drive the inhabitants out in the first place. So this seems like it is an act of disobedience. And we'll keep an eye on this to see whether or not the people of Ephraim will suffer later consequences for this act of disobedience. Now there was no treaty made with these people like the treaty was made with the Gibeonites. So they were probably treated as lower status or lower class citizens, as opposed to the way that the Gibeonites were treated. So here in chapter 17, the allotment was made to the people of Manasseh for he was the firstborn of Joseph. So notice that Ephraim gets his allotment first, whereas Manasseh gets theirs second, even though he is the firstborn typical of what we have seen in the, in the Old Testament, that the younger child actually gets the double portion or gets the inheritance that was intended for the firstborn. To Maker, the firstborn of Manasseh, the father of Gilead, were allotted Gilead and Bashan because he was a man of war. And allotments were made to the rest of the people of Manasseh by their clans, Ebiezer, Helech, Asriel, Shechem, Hefer, and Shemida. These were the male descendants of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, by their clans. And now we're referring back to a story that happened back in Numbers 26. Now Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, son of Gilead, son of Maker, son of Manasseh, had no sons, but only daughters. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milcah, and Terzah. They approached Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the leaders and said, The Lord commanded Moses to give us an inheritance along with our brothers. So according to the mouth of the Lord, he gave them an inheritance among the brothers of their father. So along with their uncles, they are going to receive an inheritance because they had no brothers to receive the inheritance for their family because the father died in the first generation. So they originally pleaded to Moses saying, hey, we're not going to get any land because our father's going to die here in the wilderness because we have no brothers. So Moses said, okay, you will indeed get land along with your uncles. Thus there fell to Manasseh 10 portions besides the land of Gilead and Bashan, which is on the other side of the Jordan because the daughters of Manasseh received an inheritance along with his sons. The land of Gilead was allotted to the rest of the people of Manasseh. Now, some might read the story of these five daughters and think this is some obscure story in the Old Testament and maybe showing God's love and equality for the women of the Bible. However, if we fast forward to the New Testament, we can see that the implications are much bigger because when we trace the lineage of Jesus' parents, Joseph goes all the way back to King David, but along the way it stops at a man named Jeconiah or Coniah because he was a wicked king. 
His spiritual right to the throne as the king of the Jews was stopped. In Jeremiah, it was spoken that his seed would never inherit the throne. So then we fast forward to Luke to look at the lineage of Mary, again, tracing all the way back to King David as prophesied. And had it not been for these five daughters and the changing of the law, Mary would have never been able to receive the inheritance that was given to her because she had no brothers. And therefore, Jesus would have never had the spiritual right to the throne. So everything that God does has a purpose. We have to trust that he's got a plan, even if that means that it's thousands of years in the future. Verse 7, the territory of Manasseh reached from Asher to Michmethath, which is east of Shechem. Then the boundary goes along southward to the inhabitants of En Tapua. The land Tapua belonged to Manasseh, but the town of Tapua on the boundary of Manasseh belonged to the people of Ephraim. Then the boundary went down to the brook of Cana, and these cities to the south of the brook among the cities of Manasseh belonged to Ephraim. Then the boundary of Manasseh goes on the north side of the brook and ends at the sea, the land to the south being Ephraim's and that to the north being Manasseh with the sea forming its boundary. On the north, Asher is reached, and on the east, Issachar. Also in Issachar and in Asher, Manasseh had Beth Sheen and its villages, and Ibliam and its villages, and the inhabitants of Dor and its villages, and the inhabitants of Endor and its villages, the inhabitants of Tayanak and its villages, and the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. The third is Naphath. Yet the people of Manasseh could not take possession of those cities, but the Canaanites persisted in dwelling in that land. Now when the people of Israel grew strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but did not utterly drive them out. Once again, we'll see the implications of this later. Then the people of Joseph spoke to Joshua saying, Why have you given me but one lot and one portion as an inheritance, although I am numerous people, I am a numerous people, since all along the Lord has blessed me, And Joshua said to them, if you are a numerous people, go up by yourselves to the forest and there clear the ground for yourselves in the land of the Perizzites and the Rephaim, since the hill country of Ephraim is too narrow for you. So they have failed to complete the task, but they still want more land. Like even though they didn't drive out the people, they're like, but give us more. It's too small for us. And so Joshua, I like his response. He's like, you know what? Don't show, don't tell me what you deserve. You all need to show me that you deserve it. And the people of Joseph said, the hill country is not enough for us. Yet all the Canaanites who dwell in the plain have chariots of iron, both those in Beth Sheen and its villages and those in Valley of Jezreel. So a very different response from Caleb, who was like, give me the land with the, with the, with the giants and uh, Anakim. I will take them down. I'll clear them out. These people are like, no, but they've got, you know, chariots of iron. So very different here. We can see the contrast. Then Joshua said to the house of Joseph, to Ephraim and Manasseh, you are a numerous people and you have great power. You shall not have one allotment only, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. So Joseph st- or Joshua starts off by telling them, no, You all need to figure this out and do this on your own. But then he ends with compassion and he ends again with the promise of God that God will be with them to drive out the Canaanites, that they're not alone, that they won't have to fight this battle by themselves. And he does, in the end, give them two allotments for both Ephraim and Manasseh. 18. Then the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. So Shiloh is about 15 miles northwest of Jericho. And this will be the centralized place for the tent or, or the tabernacle to be set up until hundreds of years later when David arrives on the scene. There remained among the people of Israel seven tribes whose inheritance had not yet been apportioned. So we wonder, okay, so they fought, they got the land, yet there's seven tribes who still have not gotten their inheritance. You wonder why? Well, there's this is showing the importance of following up and completing the task. They may have perhaps been comfortable where they were at. Who knows? We see that as a, as a common theme, though, uh, with the people of Israel. So Joshua said to the people of Israel, how long will you put off going in to take possession of the land, which the Lord, the God of your fathers has given you provide three men from each tribe. And I will send them out that they may set out and go up and down the land. They shall write a description of it with a view to their inheritances and then come to me. So these three men are going to be sent out three from each tribe. 
so 21 total, to survey the land. And they're supposed to come back and report. They shall divide it into seven portions. Judah shall continue in his territory on the south, and the house of Joseph shall continue in their territory on the north. And you shall describe the land in seven divisions and bring the description here to me. So again, showing personal responsibility here for those who are left. And I will cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. The Levites have no portion among you, don't forget that, for the priesthood of the Lord is their heritage. And Gad and Reuben and half tribe of Manasseh have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan on the east side, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. So the men arose and went, and Joshua charged those who went to write the description of the land, saying, Go up and down in the land and write a description and return to me, and I will cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went and passed up and down in the land, wrote a book, a description of it by towns in seven divisions. Then they came to Joshua to the camp at Shiloh, and Joshua cast lots for them in Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua apportioned the land to the people of Israel to each his portion." So I just, I'm thinking, are they afraid? Are they lazy? Were they disobedient? Were they scared of change? Did they have a lack of faith in the promise. I'm not sure exactly why they were holding off, but regardless, Joshua gets it done and now they will see the inheritance is given out. So we stop here in chapter 18 with the inheritance for Benjamin. Benjamin is like the peacemaker between Judah and Ephraim. The lot of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans, came up and on the territory allotted to it, fell between the people of Judah and the people of Joseph. On the north side, their boundary began at the Jordan. Then the boundary goes up to the shoulder north of Jericho, then up the hill country westward, and it ends at the wilderness of Beth-Avon. From there, the boundary passes along southward in the direction of Luz to the shoulder of Luz, that is Bethel. Then the boundary goes down to Adaroth Adar on the mountain that lies south of Lower Beth Horon. Then the boundary goes in another direction, turning on the westward side, southward from the mountain that lies to the south opposite Beth Horon, and it ends at Kiriath Baal, that is Kiriath Jerim, a city belonging to the people of Judah. This forms the westward side, and the southern side begins the outskirts of Kiriath Jerim, and the boundary goes down to the border of the mountain that overlooks the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is at the north end of the valley of Rephaim. And then it goes down the valley of Hinnom, south of the shoulder of the Jebusites, and downward to Enrogel. Then it bends in a northerly direction, going to En Shemesh, and from there goes to Galileth, which is opposite the ascent of Adamim. Then it goes down to the stone of Bohan, the son of Reuben, and passing on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Araba, it goes down to the Araba. Then the boundary passes on to the north of the shoulder of Beth Hogla, and the boundary ends at the northern bay of the Salt Sea, at the south end of the Jordan. This is the southern border. The Jordan forms its boundary on the east side, eastern side. This is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, boundary by boundary, all around. Once again, important to know your boundaries. Where are your boundaries? Now the cities of the tribe of the people of Benjamin, according to their clans, were Jericho, Beth Hogla, Emek, Kizes, Beth Araba, Zimaram, Bethel, Avim, Pera, Ophrah, Kefir, Ammonai, Ophni, Geba, 12 cities with their villages, Gibeon, Ramah, Beeroth, Mizpah, Chapira, Moza, Rechem, Erpil, Terela, Zila, Halef, Jebus, that is Jerusalem, Gibeah, and Kiriath, Jerum, 14 cities with their villages. This is the inheritance of the people of Benjamin, according to its clans. Whew, another one of those sections where we read through it, could easily pass over it, could easily just brush it off and say, this doesn't matter to me, but it matters to God. And if we can wrap our hearts around the fact that every single border, every single city, village, person mattered, it will allow our hearts to expand, to have compassion for so many other people in this world who may not matter to us or who may not impact us directly. But when we have the heart of God, we are then able to come in prayer. We are able to look for those who are hurting. We are able to see those who may be in need. And that is why it's so important. But perhaps in reading this, the most important thing that I was able to draw from it is the fact that God gave to Ephraim what was intended for Manasseh. God is the God of the second born, the second life after Jesus, our life after being born again, that he desires so much for us to be saved, but then to continue to walk with him through this journey 
on this earth as long as we are here. So he will give a double portion, a double blessing, an inheritance that we would have never gotten on this side without Jesus. So to see the significance in that today was so powerful. And this is why we do what we do. This is why we dig deeper. This is why we come every day in obedience, because we know that when we read the word of God, when we draw nearer to him, we start to take on his heart. That is when we understand our rightful ownership of that inheritance of God. So Lord, we thank you so much for being the God of the second, third, fourth, unlimited chances as long as we are here and come to you in repentance. I pray for those right now, Lord, who are still continuing to struggle with condemnation, feeling like they're not worthy of your forgiveness, feeling like they are failing time and time again. Lord, I pray that you will help them to see that you are a loving God, that you are not a God who desires to pour out his wrath because Jesus did that already. He, he took on the wrath that we deserved. And so we never again have to worry about curses or about your anger, but we can be more consumed in your loving kindness and your mercy and your grace and your favor. So I pray, Lord, that you will pour that out on your children today for those who are especially struggling. As the enemy tries to whisper lies, I pray that you silence them right now and that your Holy Spirit will be a deafening sound as you speak to them saying, come to me, I am for you, I love you, you are forgiven. You are more than a conqueror. You are the head and not the tail. You are clothed in robes of righteousness. You are the righteousness of God. Come in repentance, come and confess, and you are forgiven. Lord, thank you for being so good to us when we don't deserve it. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. We are so grateful. Thank you for our inheritance. And Lord, I just pray that we will be a people who are more compassionate, who have eyes wide open to see those in need and help us, Lord, to rise up and to be the blessing for those who need it. We praise you and honor you and love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.